very first speaker that I will introduce to you. And before I introduce, please, as, uh, as some of you may be taking notes and whatnot, uh, please at least mentally a note or on your phone or elsewhere, just make, a, make some objectives off of what you want to leave this session with and then how further you will employ the elements that we gain, inshallah, uh, through our knowledge during this session. So our very first speaker is Dr. Jonathan Brown. Uh, who is the Al-Walid bin Talal Chair of the Islamic Civilization in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. And he is the Director of Al-Walid Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. He received his BA in History from Georgetown University in 2000 and his doctorate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilization from the University of Chicago in 2006. And SubhanAllah, if I read the list of publications and, and the, and the uh, different countries that where he's traveled and studied, this is a vast, vast uh, subhanAllah explorations and, and education. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to gain from him. So I invite Dr. Jonathan Brown to the podium, please. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Has anyone ever used their computer on stage before? Can I say? Um, all right. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inna alhamdulillah wa bihi nasta'in wa salatu wa salam ala sayyid al mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Um, I didn't have time to print out what I was going to write. Um, I think someone died in a room next to mine last night in the hotel, so. What? Yeah, I, if anyone knows what actually happened, I'd be really curious because it was, it was just, just to say it was, it was a really uh, a lot of stuff happening around my room in the morning. So I didn't have time to print out what I was going to write. So I beg your apology for having the computer here. I'm not checking my email or Facebook or anything like that, I assure you. I'd have to have a really kind of incredible level of relaxation in speaking if I were to do that while talking. So uh, I'm, I'm concentrating on speaking to you all. All right. Uh, so the, the, the um, subject they asked me to talk about, I'm, I'm not joking. I think the description was, please describe how the Quran, how the true meaning of the Quran should be understood, both in its historical context and across history. Which is basically like saying, please explain all of Islamic thought to us. Uh, now, that would be fine if they gave me like, 10 minutes, because, you know, 10 minutes you can, even big things you can say, you know, uh, believe in God, do good deeds. You could do like a 30 second version. But 30 or 40 minutes, now you have to start getting into details. So it's actually a very hard topic to do. So I tried to do my best. Um, now, so, uh, the kind of main question, well, the main question of, Islamic, of Islam as a religion in history is, uh, how do we understand the message of the Quran? So during the time of the Prophet, that's not a problem because the Quran, first of all, is being revealed to answer questions about what God wants from people, what's right and what's wrong, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. And if people don't understand the Qur'an, or don't understand anything about what they're supposed to do, they can just ask the Prophet and he'll explain it to them. Um, when the Prophet dies, then the link, that immediate link with uh, divine revelation and knowledge is broken. And people, the Muslim community, from that point until today, are forced to come up with their own answers to new questions. And when I mean their own answers, I don't mean just I guess you could come up with your own answer too. Uh, but uh, they have to look to those sources that help them best understand what God wants from them. So they look at the Quran, they look at the Sunnah of the Prophet, they look at the precedents of the early Muslim community, they look at the tradition of Muslim scholarship since then, and um, they look at uh, how Muslim scholars understand uh, the priorities and best interests of the Muslim community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so the the Quran is a you know it's a, it's a fascinating document, fascinating document. Uh, and here I'm kind of talking as a historian because it's uh, both uh, 
it's an eternal message, but deposited intimately in one time and place. So the Quran, I mean, it could it could conceivably just consist of aphorisms like um, "be good to each other," uh, "a penny saved is a penny earned," um, uh, "treat others as you would have them treat you." Right? It could it could just be a set of statements that are abstract, completely abstract, and. It doesn't matter if they're revealed in China in 500 BC or Greece in 300 AD or something, it, they would essentially be understood the same way. Uh, now, there's, there's elements of the Quran that are like that, of course. But the Quran's also answering questions that are intimately and immediately related to the community of the Prophet. It's like, ex about this battle. What Why did this thing happen in this battle? What should, we, what should you do if you meet the enemy here? What should you do if someone comes and doesn't, is you know, raising their voice too loud in a, a session where the prophet is speaking? I mean, really uh, uh, almost domestic elements, things about the prophet's family life. It talks about specific people. right? Um, that verse, is only ever going to talk about Abu Lahab. There's never, you know, I guess there could be another, <laughs> a guy who named their kid Abu Lahab, and that Abu Lahab could also be a nasty person who might end up in Kalfa or something like that. I mean, this is a verse, that, I mean, an entire surah almost, that just talks about one person. So, uh, you have a, and the other thing about the Quran that makes it so interesting and unique in history is that we have it in the original language. So not only is it a document that is revealed over 22 years, oftentimes in answer to specific questions, but we have it in the original language that preserves that original experience in that culture in that time. Now, the good thing about that is that if you have any doubt about the authenticity of this communication. I mean, you can sit, we could sit around all day and debate, is the Quran really revelation or not? Okay, some people might believe it is, some people might believe it isn't. But there's not really much doubt that it comes from the middle of the seventh century, from the uh, west coast of Arabia, uh, that the events that it describes actually happened, right? So when the, the Quran talks about uh, the, the voyages to, the, to uh, winter and summer caravans. The, now, you know, the best historical research done by Western scholars, you know, who are skeptical of this material, says that actually, yeah, there was these caravans to Syria and to Yemen, right? Um, the notion of the Hanif, the idea that there's this idea of Abrahamic monotheism that is maintained in Mecca, and it's focused around the Kaaba, even though everything has become polytheist, you know, the, the best opinions of Western scholars, in my opinion, say, yeah, that this was actually, we have no evidence to suggest this, to suggest this is not the case. Yes, there was, in fact, this Hanif religion. Uh, so you have uh, almost like, you can imagine the, like a video camera or one of those TV shows and they zoom in really quickly on a scene. Like the, the Quran takes us and zooms us in immediately to that world. And you have direct contact with that world. But that has, the, the, as I said, the upside is you have direct experience. Um, if I be so bold as to tell the downside, I mean, one of the challenges is that you then have to translate between our world today and that world that's very different, very different technologically, very different culturally, very different linguistically, very different in terms of weather. Um, so the challenge that the Basically, the big challenge that Muslim scholars have throughout history is they have this revealed document, they have this revealed text, and they have to figure out, how do we read this? How do we read it the year after the Prophet dies in Mecca? How do we read it 10 years after the Prophet dies in Yemen? How do we read it 20 years after the Prophet dies in what becomes Cairo or Damascus or Isfahan? How do we read it 100 years after the Prophet dies in Cordoba or in Sindh? Uh, how do we use it to answer the questions about 
What's right, what's wrong? Um, does God know what we're going to do? If he knows what we're going to do, do we really have a choice in what we do? And is it fair that he punishes or rewards us? Uh, do I have free choice? If I don't, why am I accountable for my actions? If I do, then does God not know what I'm going to do? Like Muslims get in these debates. How are they going to answer these questions? Someone comes up to them and say, hey, I found this new plant here, which is probably not actually real. I don't know. I shouldn't judge. Let's pretend it's real. Can I eat this plant? Can I smoke this plant? Uh, Muslim scholars have to answer these questions. Uh, I have some guy owes me this money. Or we went to this new society where they have different kinds of loans and transactions and they sell their houses in this way we've never heard of before. Can we do these sales? Is that okay? Muslims have to answer these questions. How do we answer these questions? They look to the Quran. They look to the precedent of the Prophet Muhammad as understood and communicated by hadiths, reports of the things the Prophet said and did. And then of course they, have to, they get in debates about how do we know these hadiths are authentic or not. Maybe somebody made it up. How do we tell what's real, what's, what's true, what's not true? Maybe the sunnah of the Prophet is communicated by communal practice, the traditions handed down generation to generation by Muslims. Back then, only one or two generations. Uh, maybe they do it through a tradition of problem solving, that they look back, you know, the companions who'd spent a long time with uh, the Prophet, like Omar or Ali, or are able to answer questions that come up almost like they channel the way the Prophet would think about something. Just like as if when you spend decades with your parents, you know, you end up being kind of copies of them, deal with problems the same way they did. Uh, and then those companions teach their students, and those students teach their students, and you have this method of problem solving, or of, uh, of, of thinking religiously, or thinking morally handed down generation to generation. These are the different kinds of tools that Muslim scholars draw on. But they'll always, their touchstone is the Qur'an. Their touchstone is the Qur'an because it's a guaranteed link to the divine. And if the Qur'an warns, warns human beings, the Qur'an warns human beings repeatedly, uh, communities go astray when they start just speculating about the nature of God, when they start speculating about morality in a completely uh, baseless way. When they, 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 when, they, when they just start thinking about issues of which human mind cannot have any knowledge without consulting God's revelation. So this is what people go astray. So the Quran and the God in the Quran is always calling people back to revelation and to the, and the, the prophets always calling his followers back to his explanation of that revelation. And so they are always going back to these touchstones, but at the same time they know that these touchstones were not revealed in that new place, in Basra in 730, or in Isfahan in 780, or in Marv in 800, or in Nishapur in 850. This is just like a list of cities, but it's interesting. Or in Fez in 1200. They know that the Quran wasn't revealed, or in California in 2018. Uh, so they know that there's going to be an act of kind of almost translation going back to this text. How do we, what parts of this text apply all the time? What parts of this text only applied in certain situations? What parts of these texts are supposed to apply sometimes in certain situations, but not other times in other situations? Okay, so um, the Quran, it's a long way of saying the Quran is a, is the eternal word of God. It's the eternal word of God. So the, 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 the Sunni position is that the Quran is, uh, what is it? Sifatun abadiyatun qa'ima bil jawhar wa mahiya bil jawhar. Right? So the, the from, I hope I'm remembering that correctly. The Quran is an eternal, eternal attribute of God. It's an ins instance of God's eternal speech that is uh, predicated to God's essence, but not part of God's essence. It's really complicated stuff. Um, this is speculative theology things. But basically, the Quran is the eternal, uncreated word of God. Now, another school of theology called the Mu'tazilites, Mu'tazilite school of theology, which is still the main, the, the orthodox school of theology in Imami Shiism and in Zaydi Shiism. Uh, they say the Quran is created by God. Of course, it's still revelation. There's no, there's no, no one's debating whether the Quran's revelation or not. But they say instead of it being this eternal attribute of God, it's actually God kind of creates the Quran in the world. 
Um, so, if you think about this, the Sunni position is very interesting because what it says is these words that are talking about Abu Lahab, about Zayd, about yes uh, alunuka an hada, right? About uh, when when you were in the upper part and the enemy was in the lower part, uh, things like this about the battle of Badr. These words are eternal. They're eternal in, 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 in the universe. They're uncreated. Now, so the, I think the best explanation for this is that the Quran is like uh, the Dalil. It's the, it's the sign, it's the indicator. And the Madlul, the thing that is signified or indicated, is eternal. So the Dalil is created, but the thing that it's indicating is uncreated. It's a kind of a created expression of an eternal meaning, which is housed in the Lawh al Mahfuz. So, uh, the words, the actual, if I, when I say, you know, Kul huwa Allahu ahad, when I say the sounds that come out of my mouth are created, of course, I, I made that sound right now. If I write it down, the ink in the page is created, the Mus'haf is created. But the, the Madlul, the thing that is indicated, the meaning that is indicated is eternal. Okay, um, so you can think, we can think of it this way. The elements of the Qur'an, the contents of the Qur'an that deal with the eternal are the least subject to change, which makes sense, right? So when the Qul huwa Allahu ahad doesn't change in the Renaissance. It doesn't change when we discover electricity. It doesn't change when we have airplanes. Qul huwa Allahu ahad is, God is always one. Uh, you know, your senses cannot perceive God, and He He uh, encompasses all your senses. This is not going to change over, over any time or any place. Um, there are certain uh, ethical teachings in the Quran that are always true. Ya Right, so. O oh, you who believe, uh, uh, be uh, stand fast by justice and be witnesses to God, even against your own selves or against your parents or your relatives. Poor or rich, God is more deserving of you. Right? Um, uh, uh, what is it? ولا يجب أن شنعان قوم على أن لا تعدلوا عدلوا عدلوا هو أقرب التقوى right so O oh, you who believe uh, be witnesses for God and stand fast by justice and don't let your hatred of any people of any group of people make you be unjust be just be fair this is closer to the consciousness of God and piety so. These are, this is sort of a maxim, an ethical maxim, which applies all the time. It's never not going to apply. It doesn't matter if you're in China or in Spain. Uh, you could just go on forever. Right? Seek God's help in, with patience and with prayer, for indeed God is with those who, who, bear, patience, uh, who bear adversity with patience. You uh, asa and takrahu wa shayt wa huwa khayrun lakum. Uh, you may, maybe that you dislike something and that it's better for you in the end. We can use that when your girlfriend dumps you. We can use that when you ordered food at the restaurant and the waiter, waiter brings the wrong thing. I mean, we could use any number of circumstances, serious or, you know, uh, not serious. لا إكراها بالدين There's no إكراها بالدين فالدين or بالدين فإكراها بالدين, right? So, yeah, there's no compulsion in religion. This is a basic principle. So there's all the, these statements, that, these no, ask elements of the Quran that either deal with the nature of God, that deal with the nature of the hereafter, that deal with the pre-creation. So alas to be rabbikum isn't going to change. It's always eternal. Uh, and then things that are ethical teachings that are kind of decontextualized maxims that can be placed in any context and applied sensibly and equally, these are also not going to change based on time. Uh, stories, stories about the children of Israel, stories about uh, earlier prophets, obviously these are not going to change. 
Um, now, what's interesting is there are some aspects of what we might think of as theology or theological issues that uh, do change as circumstances change. What's a good example of this? The munafiqun, the hypocrites. So, has anyone here been called a hypocrite ever? I get called a hypocrite probably once every two months. It's conservative. So once every two months. So, and if we were speaking Arabic, they'd say, and to munafiq. The, the munafiq is a very serious thing in the Quran, right? People in the Quran are, uh, munafiq in the Quran are people who uh, right? Uh, and the Prophet is prohibited from praying for them. Even from praying for their forgiveness. This is very serious. This is really serious. I mean, is that, so when I, you know, when I say, um, I tell my kids, don't swear. Or don't hit anybody. Next thing you know, I'm swearing. I'm applying physical discipline or whatever. Uh, someone could say, you're a hypocrite. Does that mean that I'm like the Quranic hypocrite? No. And this is very clear. The Prophet says that the signs of the hypocrite, that when he speaks, the hypocrite, when they speak, they lie. When they are trusted with something, they betray it. And when they make a promise, they break it. We are, I'm sure, all of us are guilty of one or more or probably all of these things. Does that mean we're all munafiqs in the Quranic sense? No, we know this because Al-Hasan al-Basri, one of the main successors, scholars from the sixth generation of the successors, his mother was a servant in the uh, household of one of the Prophet's wives. And he was a student of the senior companions. Al-Hasan al-Basri explains, this is nifaq al-amal. The hadith is talking about hypocrisy in your actions. This is what we talk about when we're talking about hypocrisy. You say something, you don't follow it. You, 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 you supposedly have a value, you don't apply it. This is not what he calls nifaq al-kufr. The Quran is talking about nifaq al-kufr. These are people, think about this, right? These aren't people who meet you, you tell them about Islam, and they say, that sounds really interesting, but I really like my lifestyle or something. These are people who knew the Prophet of God, they knew him intimately. They lived with him. The Quran was in their language. They saw miracles with their own eyes. They pretended to believe, and in secret they plotted against the Prophet. It's not just that they went home and were like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to pray right now. They plotted to kill the Prophet. They, they left when they went out for the Battle of Uhud. They uh, withdrew 300 soldiers from the battlefield, leaving Muslim soldiers, Muslim army, 300 people less. So this is not some, you know, these are people who in the face of the Prophet of God betray their promises, betray their stated faith and commitment. So th this is an interesting case where you, you think about someone being a um, munafiq uh, to, you know, today, is, is, it's almost like you're, you're historically distant from this moment of intensity. This more intense interaction with the divine, this more intense interaction with the Prophet of God, a figure chosen by God, given miracles by God. And now we're light years away from that. So the Nafaq today is a very different experience. By the way, it's, it's interesting also when you look at, it's kind of a tangential issue. Where's the clock that's supposed to tell me when to shut up? Only seven minutes. Okay, well, that's fine. So, uh, like, if you look at the rulings on Tariq al-Salah, the people who leave prayer, the early Muslim scholars, Tariq al-Salah, yuqtal. If you, in, uh, this doesn't mean you like oversleep and you don't pray. It means you intentionally, someone says, hey, it's time to pray, and you say, no, I'm not going to pray. That's, we're talking about Tariq al-Salah. So the earliest, the, you know, the Imam al-Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmed, right? The person who has that is executed. Then you go a couple hundred years later, you see the rulings get lesser and lesser. 
they should be reprimanded, they should be, maybe they should be lectured, maybe they should be put in prison until they reform, maybe they should be like, you know, uh, given a good beating or something like that, right? But the, the, as people become farther and farther away from that, that certainty of revelation, disobedience in, it becomes less, you, you can't really fault people as much. Okay. Um, oh, another really good example. What's a mushrik? What is a mushrik? Anybody? Usually people say, poly, you know, polytheist or pagan. Somebody who, multi, who does shit. Someone who, uh, let's say, you know, worships idols or something like that. Uh, but what's interesting, when Muslims left the Arabian Peninsula, they could have just, let's say, in 711, the year 711, Muslims enter India. And they find people who are, you know, worshipping idols. That's actually sitting there worshipping idols. I remember when I was in India, in, in uh, Rajasthan, there's a, there a temple for a bicycle, uh, sorry, a motorcycle. It's really cool, you should go there. Uh, there's this, it's a, motorc it's a motorcycle, a miracle motorcycle, that, uh, I can't remember the story, the motorcycle went back to where its owner had died or something several times, despite being locked up in the police, you know, evidence room or something. The motorcycle's there, it's called the Umbana Temple, that's it. It's a place called Rohit. So, uh, a Muslim could go there. There's not going to be a motorcycle, obviously, but, you know, whatever, some kind of medieval motorcycle. Up there. These guys are actually worshipping the motorcycle. And, but did Muslims categorize, interesting, did they categorize Hindus as polytheists? I mean, legally. No. They treated them like people of the book. They treated them like Christians and Jews. Basically, everybody that Muslims meet, even if they're actually worshipping idols, uh, outside of Arabia, they treat as if they're people of the book. Except they don't, uh, they don't marry the women from these people, they don't eat their meat. But in terms of those people are allowed to continue practicing their religion, they get protection from the Muslim state, they pay the jizya, they can have their own courts, they can have their own community leadership. Muslims are obliged to protect them, Muslims can't hurt them, Muslims can't enslave them, etc., etc. So this is an interesting case where the, the term mushrik, also Muslims start to understand, that Muslim scholars as a community decide that the proper way to understand mushrik is not people, anybody who does shirk or who's an idolatry in the world, but it's only these people in Central Arabia who basically become irrelevant because they stop existing. Okay. So, uh, now, there's certain rulings that are only meant for certain times. Like, for example, the Quranic command to turn your faces towards, well, actually that's a bad example. We're supposed to turn our faces towards the Masjid al-Haram. That's still correct. <laughs> but the earlier ruling implied in that is that Muslims were not praying towards the, the, the Kaaba, but were praying towards Jerusalem. So there are certain commands either in the Quran or implied in the Quran that change. That change. Uh, some of them are actually changed by the Qur'an. So if you think about the verses that deal with alcohol, you know, uh, it has good things and bad things. Uh, that doesn't say drink alcohol, but it implies that it's acceptable to drink it. And then the Qur'an prohibits it. So there's certain things that are mansukh or abrogated, replaced by the Qur'an itself. Now this is interesting. There's only two examples that I know of. The Quran, remember, is not a very big book. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have a giant amount of legal, specific legal material in it. It's mostly ethical exhortations, stories, some information about the nature of God, about the Day of Judgment, about the beginning of the world, about the human history, uh, about uh, the faults and flaws that humans fall into. There's not very much in the Quran that's really just kind of very dry legal material. But there's two places where there's verses of the Qur'an, there's Qur'anic commandments that are only understood to apply in the time of the Prophet. The first one is uh, in Surah Mumtahina, the beginning, or verse 10 and 11, where it talks about women who come to Medina from Mecca, who are married there, who are married, they leave their husbands, they come to Medina from Mecca as Muslims. That Muslims should actually send, they should basically pay the dowry, the mahar of those women back to their husbands. 
So that's only, as far as I know, that only applies to the time of the Prophet. There's no, after that, Muslim scholars just are like, yeah, that, that ruling is only meant for this time. So there's, you know, I can imagine today, like if some, I'm not gonna say something, I'm not gonna say. Basically, uh, if that happened today, Muslims wouldn't follow that. We're not obliged to pay someone's mahar back to them. Okay. That, I think, is agreed upon by all scholars. The second one is actually disagreed on. This is al muallaf al This is a category of the people who can receive zakat. So there's eight categories of people that can receive zakat. One of them is those whose hearts are to be reconciled. In the three of the four Sunni schools of law, they say this group is always there. So today, today, if there's someone who becomes Muslim and is cut off from their family and their community and they don't have any money anymore, no one's doing business with them, no one's coming to their shop, then Muslims can use the cat money to help this person out. The Hanafi school and some Maliki scholars say, no, 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 no. This was only applied during the time of the Prophet. This is talking about the, the, the elite of Mecca and of Ta'if when they became Muslim after they were defeated and captured and, you know, deprived of all their property, uh, they can actually receive the cat money. But after them, that's it. This group doesn't apply anymore. So you can see there's actually disagreement amongst Muslim scholars. Some people say this ruling only applied in the time of the Prophet. Others people say no, it applies throughout history. Okay. Um, there's some rulings that are eternally valid, but only in certain, certain circumstances. So you can imagine the certain conditions that apply. If the conditions disappear, the ruling stops working. This is not, I, only, I think there's only one that I know of. There's only one that I know of. There's lots in the Hadith, but I was asked to talk about the Quran. So uh, there's in uh, Surah An-Nur, no. Yeah, Surah An-Nur, verse 58. It talks about thalath awrat, thalath awrat. Three, I'm gonna read the translation. Uh, Let your servants and those of you who are not yet come of age Ask leave of you at three times before entering the home. So your young people and servants, before they enter your home, they should ask permission to enter three times of the day, before the dawn prayer, when you undress in the noontime, and after the night prayer. So the three times that you're basically not, might not be wearing any clothing or enough clothing, dawn, noontime when you're sleeping for the siesta, and then at night. These are three times of privacy for you. Now, there's a fast, I find this fascinating, it's a fascinating hadith in the Sunnah of Abu Dawood, where a group of questioners, a group of people come from Iraq to Mecca, and they visit Ibn Abbas, the companion of the Prophet, young companion of the Prophet. And they say, in Iraq, uh, no one acts on this verse. So actually, no one does this. No one, no one knocks on doors and gets permission at these three times of the day. And why is that? Uh, Ibn Abbas says, I actually instruct my servants to do this. They, they follow this command. But he explained that this had been revealed when there was no privacy within homes or locks on the doors. People stopped. So basically, in Mecca and Medina, you know, houses were not very big. Uh, see this movie, Bilal? That's a pretty good movie, but... I mean, I think sometimes you, in these movies of portraying Mecca, it's like this big bustling city. These are small places, they're very poor places. And your house is, you know when the, the Hadiths are always talking about a wall? Like a guy has a wall? <laughs> what are you gonna do with a wall? Like, that means like that's his, that's his, that's where he hangs out. There's a wall and then there's some overhang, some reeds and stuff, and that's where he lives. So a wall was like a big thing. Four walls is even bigger. <laughs> Four walls and a door, you really made it. So basically, you go in the house and someone's not dressed, they're just standing there totally naked. There's no uh, entryway or anything like that, living room. So when Muslims go out of Arabia into Damascus and Hira and uh, uh, Fustat and all these places and eventually build their own city, they have really nice houses that have more than one room. And so they don't need this anymore. This problem, the circumstances have changed. So, uh, but here's what the interesting thing. When scholars talk about this verse, they say if the circumstances changed and went back to that situation, the verse would apply again. 
So if, I don't know, we all go on a camping trip or something like that, we each have a tent, uh, you know, you know, knock on the door of the tent, those three times. So the verse would then suddenly re, uh, re come back into action. Okay. Uh, a, a really, I think a, a fascinating example of this is the rulings on slavery. So before, this is very interesting, I just wrote a book on this. Go buy my book when it comes out, Slavery in Islam by One World. Only, I don't know what the price would be. Reasonable. Uh, so, the Quranic rulings on slavery are not applicable anymore because slavery doesn't exist. And you could say, well, why is that? This is interesting. Uh, no society that had slaves, and basically every society had slaves, certainly every civilization had slaves. No society that had slaves abolished slavery until the 1700s. In fact, I would actually go further than this. No society that had slaves even suggested abolishing slavery until the 1700s. Why is that? It was inconceivable to people. It would be like us saying we shouldn't have walking, or we shouldn't have work, or something like that. It doesn't, wouldn't make sense. Uh, you know, if we're all like, imagine 200 years from now, and we're all moving around like hoverboards constantly, or something like that, or like that movie, Walla Walla Wally, where they all like the humans are all fat and we go around on these lounge chairs, moves around. They would be like, what was this walking thing? People did it's so weird. So. The way they think about walking, that's the way we think about slavery, but that, that during the, before the 1700s, 1800s, it was just inconceivable. And Aristotle, very smart guy, died 322 of the common, before common era, he says, uh, slavery will stop when spinning wheels spin themselves. Because someone has to move things. If you don't have, if you want stuff to move or get, done or grain ground or things, you either have to have an animal do it or you have to have a person do it. When does slavery become something that people start proposing, abolishing, and then feeling compelled to abolish? Around the same time that people discover, hey, we can take coal, put it in fire, make steam, steam makes wheel go around, wheel makes thing move, wheel makes thing pump, wheel, uh, steam, coal makes really hot fires, hot fires you can make steel instead of other iron that's not really that tough. Steel, you can make tools, you can make bridge girders, you can make uh, little things that you can cut other things with. Suddenly, you have bicycles. It's weird, people know, didn't have bicycles before the 1800s, why? People didn't think about this? No, because they didn't have the materials to produce them. So, uh, when material circumstances change, certain institutions can cease to exist, uh, the rulings disappear. Okay. Uh, I think it went through all the types, which means I accomplished my talk in slightly over time. Okay, Jazakumullah Khair, hopefully it was useful. If there was anything I said that was wrong, I seek God's forgiveness. And if there was any benefits, uh, I thank God for his blessings. Jazakumullah Khair. Jazakumullah Khair. Dr. Brown, subhanAllah.